Thanks for downloading this episode of Historical Hot or Not. Just a quick note to say, I sat down to edit this on the night of the Oscars. And as I'm editing the episode, I hear me in the past say, oh, I stayed up last night to watch the Oscars, which made me realise that I've sat on this episode for 12 months. I could have not mentioned this at the beginning, except I then do go on to talk about everything everywhere all at once, uh, winning all the Oscars, which was 12 months ago. So if you hear that and think, but hang on, it was Oppenheimer that won all those awards. Uh, yeah, it's because this is a very old episode, um, but it's fine. The banter and lols feel as fresh as they did in March 2023. Or not. You be the judge. Enjoy. Might be a Viking or a Saxon or a Roman, but tell me, do you like them? Would you sex them? Would you bone them? Would you go to bed with King Ethelred? Would you bonk William the Conqueror up in the sheets with Samuel Pepys? Mussolini was a meanie, led a fascist insurrection, but does he make you creamy? Does he give you an erection? Would you pork Richard the Duke of York? Does a boner start when you think of Bonaparte? Are you sexually aroused at the thought of Pol Pot? Historical Hot or Not? Hello and welcome to Historical Hot or Not, the only history podcast that looks at the life and times of history's most celebrated figures and asks, yes, but would you? It's the only podcast that explains the economic theory behind Adam Smith's free hand of the market and then uses his other hand to sexually gratify our private equity zones. Kath, when these intros get too convoluted, do stop me. I am your co-host, <laughs> Aidan McCaffrey. I am not a historian, and this is... Catherine Mather, and I am also not a historian, but we are comedians and uh, we are horny for history. Uh, and that's why we've decided to get together and talk about um, history and, uh, and objectifying those people. It's not even the history of sex, is it? I mean, that, no. that could be a whole interesting podcast. It's, mu- it's, it much less, it's much less interesting and much less educational than that. It is. I also like that Ye- uh, Aidan has just told me that he's been up uh, watching the Oscars last night. I feel like that has very much come through uh in your delivery of the intro today <laughs> uh just fatigued right let's just fucking do this one shall we <laughs> that's just the fatigue i have with life i actually oh. was i actually was thinking of, of delivering the intros in a less big manner going forward because mm-hmm. often what happens is i try and regulate the audio level to what my volume is which but it's way too big at the start and then i yeah. just sort of slope off a bit to my normal mm-hmm. volume, so that you've got to like manipulate the volume for different sections of speech. So I'll, just, I'll give it a more casual intro. Uh, yeah. A bit less like I'm presenting the Top 40 Countdown on Radio 1, uh, and a bit more like it's a Sunday morning, you're, you're, you're in your bath towel, and you just want to listen to some relaxing historical sex talk. That kind of vibe, Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but you, now you'll never host the top 40 and I just think that's a shame you know you need to show them what you got Aidan well yeah but if if I have to submit um if I have to submit some kind of recording to be top 40 I'll send them one of the early episodes but yeah if Jazz FM want me I send him one of the new I've just spent all night watching uh, a Hollywood award ceremony recordings where I'm basically almost asleep that's that's what how I'll do it yeah, no, I, I respect that you're showing them you've got range. <laughs> I have got, we have, we've got lots of range, Kath. Uh, how yeah. are you anyway? Um, yeah, how are you doing, Kath? We sort of, I'm great. We usually, do, we usually do the how are you chat pre-episode, but pre-episode was largely taken up by technical catastrophes. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, largely so here... on my end, as <laughs> always. I'm good, thank you, Aidan. I, um, I celebrated International Women's Day by getting a car and immediately just stalling it repeatedly in the middle of the main road and uh, <laughs> let me tell you you know how tightly wound the people of london are yeah. it is not better when you put them in a tin can uh, that cannot move anywhere because uh, it's too busy they were furious with me the people of london hate me even more now and oh, they're all no. honking at me and they're, most, they're like what is honking doing like it's I'd have, I'd have just thought I was doing absolutely fine here <laughs> if you weren't there. 
to be meh, meh. It's like, I mean, it's like, have you ever seen like an Indian traffic jam where nothing's moving and then everyone starts honking? Mm-hmm. It's not made the situation better. If anything, it's just made it infinitely worse. Exactly. Um, I I hate people. As well, a lot of men have been uh, like, oh, do you, do you get cryy when you uh, get overwhelmed in the car? No, I get angry. I, I'm going to be one of those people that you read about in the news that just like has a bat in the car. And when someone honks me, I'll just get out of it and, and smash it up. I won't. <laughs> I will not Britney Spears it. But I already <laughs> feel like doing that. Kath, my policy in terms of promoting this podcast is whatever works. And if the thing that sends us viral is dash cam, <laughs> dash cam footage on TikTok of you getting out of a car with a baseball bat and smashing <laughs> up a Land Rover, I'm fine with that. Just make sure if that gets uploaded, you tag it. Hashtag hot not pod. That's all I'm asking. I will. And then I can't imagine I'd be able to make a very quick getaway through <laughs> London. <laughs> That's the thing. Cause I feel like I'd only, I'd only, well, I'd never do that because I'm a coward. But if I did, I'd be like, do I have a getaway here? Is there a nice mm-hmm. runway of clear road in front of me? If so, give me the bat. Uh, I need to go and smash up that Kia Sportage that's honking at me from behind. Exactly. You, the, what you want to do is if you're trying to make a quick getaway, get into a vehicle that is registered in your name to your home <laughs> address and th- they'll never be able to find you. Exactly. Uh, how uh, have you been, Aidan? Um, uh, okay. Um, I had a meltdown earlier today because I went out, so- I went to buy some eggs. Right. Um, I feel like eggs is coming up a lot on this podcast because we met up in Manchester and just ate loads of eggs. We did, I like, yeah. <laughs> I, I like eggs. I went to buy some eggs. I got back, put my keys down, blah, 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 had dinner. Then I had to go. I said I was going to go to my mum's this afternoon. So I got my shoes and to go to my mum's. Couldn't find my keys. And, it, and I had a proper full on, I have early onset Alzheimer's, uh, like proper hating myself. Why can I never remember anything? What have I done with them? I mean, I looked everywhere, Kath. Like mm-hmm. I was turning, I was turning up the sofa cushions. I was looking on the bookshelf. I I started to think, what if I just did something really dumb? Like you know, if you try to do two things at once, and then you find out you've like put the milk on the key shelf, and then you've put the keys mm-hmm. in the fridge. I was like, did I do that? Because I remember bringing the milk in, hadn't done that. Just I turned over every stone. It was insane. Uh, I then convinced myself that I'd left the keys in the door outside. Someone had then locked it, me in and taken <laughs> the keys, uh, with the plan that they would come back later when I was sleeping and either steal my car with the keys or just let themselves into the house and steal some stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. and I was going to say kill you, but sure, steal your stuff. <laughs> and then I started to get upset that I had to make a decision then because of that. Well, do I just ring someone to change the locks? I have to do that. Otherwise, the person's going to come in tonight. And and then I was getting upset about that. It was insane. I texted. I was also locked in. So I texted my wife and said, do we have a key in the house, a spare key? She was like, well, no, not really. Uh, and anyway, I, I hung up. I was upset. And then I, can't, I don't know why I did it, but I sort of was just looking in the corner of the kitchen. And there's like a series of hooks. And the, the only keys we put on these hooks, you know, like the electricity meter keys or the gas meter key. Mm-hmm. And my keys were just there. And that sounds like a really obvious place to have left my keys on a hook with other keys on it. But I never... Yeah, in, the, in the key hook corner. <laughs> yeah, the, the famous key hook that the house arrived with. But the thing is, Kathy, I never put my keys there. I never put my <laughs> keys on those hooks. So therefore, I would never think... You, I was literally looking inside a box of tea bags for my keys. That's how insane <laughs> I got. And I never thought to look on the actual key hooks in the corner of the kitchen. Uh, and it was also one of those things where just finding them reset my entire emotional emotional balance like that. You yeah. know, <laughs> it's just like the whole panic was over. I don't have early on Alzheimer's. And I literally got on with the rest of the day with a whistle in my voice and a spring in my step. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, that sounds uh, ridiculously stupid, Ed, and very foolish of you. 
I honestly think I'm more tired from the emotional expenditure I did there <laughs> than the fact that I stayed up till 4 p.m. to watch 4 a.m. to watch the Academy Awards and then I only had about four or five hours sleep. It was mu- it yeah. was much more draining there. Uh, I was literally thinking thoughts like, "This is the rest of my life. This is mm-hmm. the rest of my life." Forgetting things like house. this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. just locked in my wife's not going to let me out she's going to know about this and just move in somewhere else and I've just got mm-hmm. to then figure out how long can I make the food in this house survive can I eat two cats how much meat do they have on them how long is that going to keep me going well anyway. yeah uh one thing because this story did begin with eggs and I've been to three shops today to try and find eggs can't uh and I was thinking it it is insane the food shortages that we have now because i was at a gig earlier this week uh not earlier this week it's literally monday last week uh i was at a gig <laughs> last week and uh it was this woman's 32nd birthday and her friends had bought her a, a punnet of beef tomatoes <laughs> because vegetables are rare now and it all this clubbed in 10 pound each <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah, we, we're doing rationing, but there is no war. We just <laughs> fucked ourselves. That's like amazing. Like you did with your keys. <laughs> That's really good. I like that. They're very considerate friends. I'd, lo- I'd love it if somebody did that for me. I do find tend to find out with these kind of shortages. I mean, maybe it's different in London. The kind of places that have shortages are supermarkets where people panic by. Uh, yeah. So I remember when the toilet roll thing happened in the, in the pandemic. You could, there's no supermarket within 50 miles of me that had toilet roll. But all you had to do was just go to a corner shop and they had them. And there was something yeah. weird about, it was the mentality of people who think that the local Asda is the only kind of place in human existence where you can buy food and household goods. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then everyone else was just like, well, I'll just, yeah, I'll just try the, the news agents down the road. And it's just like piled. It's literally like, pyramids of toilet rolls in there because no one's thinking of actually going into those places so um yeah, i don't know maybe, maybe try that try your local yeah. fruit and veg merchant that's what i say well i think it was the strangest thing that people the toilet roll was the thing that people were like well this is irreplaceable this is a thing that we could not fashion out of anything at all that we could just kind of find lying around <laughs> yeah. uh, whereas food oh no food that's fine Loads of food everywhere. Kathy, say that. Have you ever tried to wipe your ass with a newspaper? It's I have. Ha- it's horrendous. It is, yeah. I'm not saying that that's like my <laughs> go to, Aiden. I'm just yeah. saying that uh, I reckon I could probably do without toilet paper longer than I could do without tea or well, eggs. I couldn't go without tea. But I also am so well stocked on tea. I think I would. I think I'd see out a potential tea shortage. Fine, as long as I was willing to transfer briefly to say Redbush or decaffeinated. I've got all sorts of tea mm-hmm. in my house. I will say actually, the deprivation of tea might be a, a theme on today's subject, Kath. Well, shall we tell these good people uh, the premise of our podcast and then get the fuck on with it? So, historical hot or not, uh, we have a cheeky little look at the eTrust app uh, each week, uh, or whatever interval these podcasts are coming out in. We will suggest a potential suitor to one another. This week, Aidan will be suggesting, I assume a gentleman to me, although it's not always that heteronormative. Uh, and if I decide that, yeah, yeah, I would fuck them, then they'll go on the bay, you'll tap that a strip. And if not, well, then we can all just forget they ever existed. If you want to play along with this, we're going to start by, uh, I'm going to show Catherine the subject profile picture on the historical dating app eTroved. You can have, there's a link to this photograph in the podcast notes. Play along. We'll, we'll make an initial superficial assessment and then we'll move on to the character assessment. Oh yeah, I need to send you the thing. I'm so tired. Uh, why do I do this to myself? I, I even know, I even know the Oscars is silly. I like I know it's <laughs> I, I know it's dumb. <laughs> I just really like films. I really like things that celebrate films. And I kind of knew my favourite film of last year, everything, everywhere, all at once. I kind of knew it was probably gonna sweep the board. 
So I thought, yeah, I'm going to stay up and watch it. I knew I had two. I knew I had a podcast recording today. I knew I had a podcast (laughs) recording tomorrow. I know I've got eight (laughs) hours of office work in between that. I didn't care. Why? Because I hate myself. Hey. Right, I've just sent you a link. Sorry, I should have sent you a photo, but ah, fuck you, Kath. You can you, you can click on a link. I can click on a link. Don't you? Oh, okay. So, Kath, this is Norman. He is sixty-five, and he is from Glasgow. Ah, see, I quite like the Scottish accent. So, this is a a a photograph in sepia. I think they call it. He, if I had to describe him, first two words I thought were silver fox. Yes. He's uh he's hair, he's got hair on top but it's kind of thinning but it, the beard really is where it's at that's quite a uh, a, a lovely thing um he is he's got a big white like, bushy beard hasn't he he has yeah it's it's very present that's the word I wanted to use uh he's he's got sad eyes I think um. He uh, he seems to be wearing a, a suit, which I assume means that he's quite well to do. It looks dirty, but I think that's the photograph rather than him. Uh, and I mean, that looks to be like a bow tie, but sort of how I do it up because I can't really do <laughs> a bow wrong. tie. Up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, incorrectly. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you. He is old enough to be my father. Uh, and for that reason, it is currently a no. Oh. Uh, but that's not, um, you know, that that's not a reflection on how he looks. He's a, he's a good 60 odd year old. Just, you know, I, I do like people a little more age appropriate. Kath, you should have watched the Oscars. There were so many fit 65 year olds. It was mental. Because <laughs> I was like Googling, hang on, how would she do it? Like Sigourney Weaver would appear. I'd be like, fucking hell, she's still hot. Seven, 73, Kath. Mental. What? Yeah, Michelle Yeo is like 61. <laughs> she looks about Jesus 40. Christ. Yeah, but there's loads of, they kept bringing people on there. Halle Berry, 55. Insane. It's just like, didn't realise I was into sexagenarian women, but it turns out after watching <laughs> the Oscars, I absolutely am. But Kath, at least based on appearance, you're not into this sexagenarian man. I actually think he is quite good looking. I think he's, mm. I thought he had quite piercing eyes, but it's funny you're saying he has sad eyes. I think I'm drawn to his eyes. Probably because I have sad eyes as well. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like I'm actually just seeing my own uh, sadness at the state of the world reflected back at me. Um, but yeah, no. The kindred spirit. Do you know what, actually? Before we carry on, I I didn't think to look for a picture of him when he was young, but I'm fairly sure there isn't one. Oh, let's have a look. Yeah. So, let's he's, actually, he's actually the kind of person who's not much on him online. Ah, oh, nice. So actually, if you Google... He's called Norman Kerr. If you Google Norman Kerr Young, there's only like 15 results. And the only result for him is that picture of him as a relatively older man. But anyway, let's get into his life. According to Wikipedia, Norman Shanks Kerr was born in Glasgow, Scotland on the 17th of May, 1834, to Alexandra Kerr, a merchant and ship owner, and Helen Nee Shanks Kerr, who was a woman. Yeah, so you were right, actually. I think they are well to do. And if you're a merchant and a ship owner, you're going to have some of those... uh, what is it? Did Scotland dollar dollar dollar, 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 dollar bills? Does Scotland yeah. have its own currency back then? I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, I missed the year because I was looking up uh, Norman Kerr Young, and what's come up is someone who looks like I probably could have done a school shooting. That is the <laughs> first one. The second image is the one that you've sent me. The third one seems to be a sort of religious picture of a a dying man being wheelbarrowed and then number four is a gravestone so <laughs> I, I just felt like people needed to to know that that's <laughs> the... yeah. there is some weird stuff Sorry. in here there's also what like time a period is thing again he was born in 1834 okay um, so he is a victorian gentleman Norman became a doctor of medicine and a master of surgery. After graduating in 1861 from the University of Glasgow, he, was, he worked as a journalist for the Glasgow Mail. From an early age, he developed an interest in the effects of alcoholism, joining temperance groups such as the Coffee Tavern Company of Glasgow. He was the first secretary of the Glasgow Abstainers Union, and he organised the first meeting of the United Kingdom Alliance in Manchester. According to the Lost Hospitals of London, he was the honorary consulting physician of the Dalrymple House for Inebriates. 
calf. Do you like it when a lover gets too much into one thing? <laughs> would, be, <laughs> would this annoy you? Uh, would you be saying to him, look, Norman, this is all great, all this temperance stuff, but maybe like throw some darts in there or something. Mix it up. Yeah. Have, have more than one hobby. Go on, go to the pub, lighten it. Oh, no, wait, yeah. sorry, you don't like that. Um, <laughs> I guess if it's something I'm interested in as well, I don't mind. But um, yeah, I think I am that partner to be honest <laughs> uh unfortunately i i just i have like three interests and that's that's it comedy. that is two two more than this guy though well yeah that's comedy uh tetris and knitting <laughs> are my interests but um <laughs> yeah i think if it's because uh, temperance it's quite judgmental isn't it i find like i understand that alcoholism is a disease and it, it, it's good that they had a hospital for them uh to help these people uh you know addiction is a serious matter it's a medical issue but if in order to stop that happening you're stopping everyone from having a drink well that seems a bit shitty uh lighten up norm have a bit <laughs> of fun well it's interesting this issue i think because we have the benefit of hindsight to an extent which we know it doesn't work like it never took off in britain i think had it have worked in america then maybe it would have taken off here but because it didn't, it just was an absolute disaster. It just You can't stop people drinking. And if you no. try, you just create um, a criminal underworld that will service that need. But I, I, I sort of have some sim sympathy with the temperance movement because I think the reason it cropped up was because cities at the time were such horrible, dirty places of like overpopulation and bad sanitation. And, you know, there was lots of poor people just crammed into slums. And I don't know, I think like... I'm I'm not really explaining this very well, but I think the culture around what I, we think of cities as good things now. At least I think we do. I do. I'm a big fan of London. You live in London. I think you like London. Um, I do. But they just weren't seen as good places back then. They were just seen as horrible and chimneys spewing black smoke into the air and street urchins everywhere. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't. Uh, yeah. I think I think sort of the idea of the public house overflowing with drunkards was sort of seen as part of this so and as someone who tries elimination diets and did go about six or seven years without having any alcohol this part i, I just think i look back then and even though i know yeah temperance is, is a bad idea i feel like if i was there then i probably would have been like yeah temperance this is a good idea this is like self-improvement or something but hey maybe that's yeah. just me I guess as well, if you're living in that level of poverty and a drink is the only thing that uh, makes you forget it briefly, then uh, it seems a bit mean to take that away from people. Um, but then it also does come down to sort of self-regarding and other regarding acts, doesn't it? So yeah. uh, if you get drunk and fuck up your liver, that's just you. But if you're getting drunk, fucking up your liver and stealing from people and hitting people well that starts to affect other people and then it's an issue so Absolutely. it is a very murky one one thing that i would like to say entirely unrelated to uh this deep dive on alcoholism that we're doing is uh i i, I absolutely adore how he's like yeah i just became a doctor surgeon journalist they like the amount of study and unpaid internships that you would have to do to become <laughs> one of those now is too many. Whereas in the Victorian <laughs> times, it was like, yeah, I'll put my fingers up a fanny. I could, uh, I could get a baby out of there, no problem. I'm a doctor. I'm a fuck it. I'm a surgeon as well. I'll write about it, journalist. Um, we'll stick. The, the, there'll be more about sticking fingers up fannies later, uh, as well as oh, tea good. drinking. There's lots of interesting life. Um, <laughs> According to the British Journal for the Study of Inebriety and the Times, as in the Times is also one of the sources, Kerr moved to London and joined the Church of England Temperance Society, speaking at their annual conference, and he supported the British Women's Temperance Association. He was also a supporter of Society for the Society for Promoting Legislation to Control and Cure Habitual Drunkards. Kath, I'm starting to think that the temperance movement failed in England because there were too many temperance movements. <laughs> there were too mm -hmm. many groups, you know, 
Uh, are you in the temperance movement? No, I'm the treasurer of the Canine Temperance Association for <laughs> Dogs Against Drinking. Also, is it me or is the word, I think the word drunkard has too much of a comical association. <laughs> yeah, it does sound quite funny, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm sure then it was just something like GPs and uh, public health officials use, but now it just feels like, oh, this guy is absolute drunkard. He's a legend. You know, he might as well call it the the Society for Helping Pissheads or the Association for Helping Cider Sponges. <laughs> I did watch a, a very, very long documentary about Prohibition. Um, it, I mean, we're talking about five hours worth of documentary here. Um, and one of the points uh, that they sort of made was that prior to Prohibition, people would, you know, the whole, well, people would drink beer for breakfast. They would, yeah, but it'd be about 2%. <laughs> and yeah. you could function on it but then beer started getting stronger so if you drank the amount of uh booze that you're drinking on it was two percent but it's five percent then it's gonna fuck you up and people just didn't change their drinking habits to accommodate the uh strength of the the alcohol that's interesting and, uh, yeah so then therefore people got drunker and it was largely women who were uh, doing these temperance movements because they were the ones that had to deal with the fact that there was no money to feed the family when he'd gone and drunk it all and also they were the ones getting hit when they got home uh, yes. and it, from that perspective yeah I'd hate booze as well. I think that's what in my post Oscar fatigue I was sort of trying to get at when I was talking about I can see why people at this time viewed booze as this great evil um, mm. That 2% thing is interesting. I mean, I I only drink session ales before 9am, but after 9am, anything goes. Yeah, I'm more of a wine drinker myself. But, um, well, even even before 9am? Yeah, before breakfast. After that, I go on to the beers, but you got to start strong, <laughs> taper off. Sure. What would you call your temperance society, Kath? And I think you can just, just pick a demographic, <laughs> uh, <laughs> throw the word temperance in there, you can have like society association. Just like literally, it's like a, you know, it's like a fruit machine. You press a button and a different one for each comes down. You've got yourself a temperance society. All right, then. So, how about old Cathy's? <laughs> this is starting to sound uh, like a pub. <laughs> old Cathy's Drunkard Disgust League. Drunkard Disgust League. That's pretty yeah. good. I like it. Uh, oh, yes. My, I came up with the Gentleman's Union of Chamomile Converts uh, or the Society for the No Longer Getting Shit-Faced or the 9pm Club in reference to bedtime. Perfect. <laughs> According to Martha Allen's 1900 writing, Alcohol, a Dangerous and Unnecessary Medicine, How and Why, What Medical Writers Say, which was a temperance publication, which you can probably figure out from the ludicrous name, Kerr mm -hmm. was Norman Kerr was even against the use of alcohol in medicine, even though when he was a resident of America, people were unwilling to use him because he wouldn't prescribe booze. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> quite funny. Uh, here's a plaster. What the fuck? Can, can, I, can I get a second opinion? Where's my you? Where's the normal guy? Oh, he's off today. Um, Kath, this is like how you had to switch GP whenever you're denied medical marijuana for mild complaints. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, listen, I've got this paper cut. <laughs> I I'm go going to need a spliff, baby. <laughs> How did go you on. get in here? <laughs> <laughs> I've had my second headache in 12 months. I'd like an ounce of hash, please. <laughs> Thanking you. According to the records yeah. of the Borough of Marlebone, he came after churches giving lectures on the ancient use of non-alcoholic wine in historical churches. Kath, this guy wouldn't prescribe the blood of Christ to a sinner. He's hardcore. You can imagine him there. Uh, when you transubstantiate the wine into the blood of Christ, could you use something a bit lighter, like, say, Ribena? Um, <laughs> I also can't do a Scottish accent, so I'm doing my generic posh voice whenever I do an impression of uh, Norman Kerr. Kerr was not just a mouthpiece. He was influential in getting laws changed to help inebriates. According to the British Journal of Addiction, Kerr's efforts to set up reform houses for drunks rather than just throwing them in jail helped result in the Inebriates Act of 1898, which encouraged local authorities to set up state-certified reformatories to treat habitual drunkards. Kath, how much do you drink, if you don't mind me asking? Are you an odd tipple lass? 
Or are you one of those people who has to wear a hoodie when they take their weekly empties to the Asda glass bins and no one can see their <laughs> <laughs> no one can see their twenty bottle shame? No, I you know what, I don't actually drink much anymore. Uh if you'd have asked me that ten years ago, it would have been a very different answer. But um yeah, it's just I realised that it makes me feel rubbish and I don't really like it. And uh and then uh, it's very difficult to uh, answer the question, why am I doing it, isn't it, when that's the case? <laughs> the whole weekly empties thing, because I only actually empty all the glass bottles every three or four months because I don't, we don't drink that much. But yeah. you always look like you've been getting smashed on the reg whenever you empty them. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're doing it every, you're emptying those glass bottles every three days or every three months. You're still just emptying empty bottles of booze into um the biggest brown bin anyone has ever seen in their life. Yeah, the echo chamber. Very loud. Yes. According to the New South Wales Evening News, Kerr was also critical of habitual and overuse of narcotics, despite recognising their medical benefits in limited quantities. Kathy, you're a massive drug user. Uh, listeners can't <laughs> hear you, but you currently have a spliff in your mouth, a belt around your arm, and a little Bunsen burner slowly cooking up some lovely heroin in a spoon. So uh, mm -hmm. the next bit you might find off-putting. Basically, he, was, he didn't want people to do drugs either. Uh, he also had a pop at caffeine consumption, saying, both tea and coffee are used in excess. I found a patient insensible in her room one day who had drunk nothing but tea, but she had consumed a pound of tea in the day. All right, Kerr, you can wow. take my booze, you can take my morphine, but you can prize my PG tips from my cold, dead British hands over my cold, dead body. Yes, and my yeah. cold, dead cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how they do things up there in Scotland, but in England, we hate ourselves and we drink a lot of tea to make up for it. And you're not touching it. You know what? To be fair, it sounds like his heart's in the right place. Like, I, I think like it is. him. I, I do. I, I... I guess you could view him as a bit of a puritanical dickhead because he is, but <laughs> it, he is right as well. Yes. Like so, vegans. We all hate them. They're not wrong. <laughs> exactly. That's why people don't like them because yeah. they're right. Puritanicalism. It, it's the key to a lot of bugbears in society. Um, like if you think about the whole woke versus anti-woke or even the PC versus anti-PC debate that has evolved from. It sort of stems from that, that just some people just don't like being told what to do, do they? Uh, no. One of my brothers is, is not particularly political. He's not woke or anti-woke, but I've noticed it's the puritanical thing. It's, it's someone saying, this is what you should, that it just really, really gets to him, really fucks him off. Mm -hmm. And I think like, yeah, I think that's sort of key, key to a lot of things. I think this guy, we'll get into this a bit later, but I think he was quite polite. I, I don't think he was like, he was sort of campaigning for it, but I don't think he was necessarily shoving it in people's face. And the way he did popularize, I will get into it. I'm sort of like preempting things I'm about to say. Um, Kerr wrote a paper called What Shall We Do With Alcoholic Inebriates Apparently Insane? Uh, I like the title of that paper because I think if that had been published in the 1990s, an acid house outfit would have definitely named their first <laughs> album Alcoholic Inebriates Apparently Insane. It sounds like yeah. a great <laughs> rave rave band name from, from the uh, uh, Madchester scene. Yeah, Apparently Insane would be in, um, in brackets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or they'd be called AIAI, and people would be like, oh, is that a reference to computer? And they'd be like, no, nah, it's alcohol and ebriots apparently insane because we're mad for it. Way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kath, one of the reasons I wanted to cover Norman Kerr is that I think his attitudes do seem modern, even by our woke 2020 cancel culture vulture standards. Um, mm. Have you heard of Florence Maybrick? Uh, no. She was an 1890s woman who was accused of murdering her husband, James Maybrick, a hypochondriac who regularly took prescription chemicals containing poisonous elements. Yeah, the case was a cause celebrate at the time with a public feeling she had been falsely accused. The government commuted her death sentence, but she still spent several years in prison for a crime which for which she was never charged. According to a contemporary edition of the St. James's Gazette, Kerr wrote a letter concerning the medical evidence in the trial saying, justice will not be satisfied until Mrs. Maybrick receives a free pardon. Mm. It's good, isn't it? Well, it was, 
using it for good then i guess yeah he's intervening according to a contemporary edition of the birmingham daily post in 1892 kirk co-founded the church sanitary association with the aims of ensuring to everyone pure air pure water a wholesome dwelling and surrounding safeguarded from preventable diseases and also a free edition of the all saints hit single pure shores uh, i just made it, put that last bit on the spot because really <laughs> i thought i thought pure air pure water pure shores um <laughs> According to a contemporary edition of the Morning Post, in an 1881 outbreak of typhus in Marlebone, he urged a local vestry, which was the contemporary equivalent of a town council, to remove the insanitary conditions which have hitherto fostered the disease, condemning the state of the local slums in which he criticised the construction of houses, the proximity of toilets to bedrooms, the ventilation, and then in one instance saying, the sewage too is defective wow even even the sewage is defective here <laughs> <laughs> i'm so glad you picked up on that because when i read that i was like hang on does he mean the sewage system he doesn't does he, he he's saying the poo is defective <laughs> right <laughs> i mean given their diet yeah probably i think defective is an odd word to describe sewage because defective implies a, a mechanical failure like a mechanism <laughs> that stopped working yeah. now maybe there was something about 19th century feces that we're not aware of like maybe 19th century poop had clockwork implements you know and maybe <laughs> his... steampunk yeah yeah Ste steampunk poo or steampunk shite <laughs> uh, you can imagine him saying as we know, the fecal matter has a series of cogs inside which power mechanical legs, which allow the turd to independently locate the nearest sewer system and make itself scarce. Well, obviously, mm. that has failed the people of Marlebone in this instance. Yeah, um, well, again, it sounds like he knew what he was talking about in a way that other people clearly didn't. Or maybe didn't give a shit about whether they were keeping people sleeping next to a toilet. Just they forever. didn't give a defective shit. Okay. <laughs> no, they did not. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but this is the thing. It's, it's coming from a medical point of view. We like alcohol does damage you if you drink it in excess, mm. doesn't it? Um, yeah, especially. Um, to be fair, I've slept next to many a toilet because of alcohol, but maybe yeah. not in quite the same way as these poor people. Yeah, exactly. Uh, living in a slum in which your pillow is just another man's excrement not good for your health not good for your lungs no. he knows this um here's the thing i like about him and this is what i was getting at early this is what i was getting at earlier when i was saying i think his approach to it's fairly polite he was very polite in the urging of the vestry to fix the sanitation issue addressing them as your honorable board and apologizing the urgency of this case must be my excuse for this trespassing on your courtesy and forbearance i like it excuse my impertinence but there appears to be some street urchins wading through their own shite on charles street uh, i don't suppose you could do something about it no worries if not good day to you sir <laughs> i'm so sorry for interrupting your nice meal but thousands are dying preventively <laughs> because you can't be asked to put anything back into society, you <laughs> awful fucking leech. Imagine if, that's how the left, imagine if that's how the left spoke to Tory. Like now when we criticise the Tories, it's like, fuck these cunts, hashtag fuck the Tories, hashtag fuck these cunts. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I feel like in the 19th century, it's like, excuse me, uh, I don't know if you notice people have noticed but you've killed quite a lot of people during your 13 years of government through a uh, mismanagement of the social and economic levers of the country but uh, i can see you're busy so maybe I'll, I'll come back later apologies for the interruption so you still get that now though don't you like when uh, in the newspapers people get into trouble for being for calling tories cunt but yeah. they'll be calling them a cunt because they killed thousands of people <laughs> And the, in the newspaper, it's just like, how dare they say horrible things to these people who, yeah, okay, have killed thousands and but will it's like, kill more. It's like, a, it's about a standard of decorum. It's like how in Parliament you can't, you don't accuse someone of being a liar, I don't think. Um, okay. Like I, oh, I, mean, I get I mean, kicked out of it so quickly. <laughs> like, like a principle you've never heard Keir Starmer call Johnson a liar, even though it's so on record how obvious his lies are you know you never hear starmer go this government has given us nothing but lies for the last <laughs> several years of them being in power that's my starmer impression 
That is quite good. I don't like I him either, great. to be fair. He's a vegetarian. According to Wikipedia, Co is a vegetarian and an advocate for vegetarianism, often cooking for large crowds to demonstrate the value of meatless meals. According to the Kilburn Times, he cooked up such a meal for 100 persons at the Walmer Castle Cafe Tavern. According to records in the borough of Marlebone, he cooked a vegetable stew for 250 poor people. I like that. He's killing two birds with one stone. He's saying, hey, vegetarian food's all right, and he's doing it by feeding poor people. Well... It's very honourable. I like that he's done that. Uh, not every meal has to have be- uh, meat in it, does it? You know, no. but it does seem a little bit mean telling people who are literally begging in the street, be a vegetarian. Like, listen, pal, I'm <laughs> going to eat whatever the fuck I can get my hands on. I'm not. <laughs> they weren't really counting it. it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if he'd present a very lightly charred cow to them that had barely been cooked properly, they would have eaten it, you know what I mean? Mm. And my poo is defective as fuck. Just get something in my belly. Um, I'm doing those white poos that dogs <laughs> used to do. That's how defective it is. <laughs> I've not seen one of those in 25 years. I don't miss them. Yeah. No, that's because people look after the dogs and feed them properly now. Was that it? I thought it was like, mm. because no one picked up the poo, some kind of, something in the air just made them go white after a while. No, I think it was that they were getting fed shit rather than dog food. Yeah, pe- uh, cheap pizzas from Mazda. Mm-hmm. Ah, Kerr's never-ending train of modern attitudes did not end at animals. According to an 1878 edition of the Times, a motion was proposed to exclude women practitioners from the British Medical Association following the election of Francis Hogan and Mrs. Garrett Anderson saying Dr. Norman Kerr opposed the motion. He considered that holding this opinion, he should be doing a mean, unmanly and unjust act if he remained silent. There was no sex in art and science. In reply to the suggestion that some medical men objected to discuss questions with medical women, he urged that such men were inconsistent in as much as they treated patients in the presence of a nurse and made no scruple of modesty in other respects. It was not until 1892 that women were admitted to the British Medical Association. This cat is ahead of his time, like a tabby riding a DeLorean into the year 3000. That's got to be an orifice opener, right, Kath? Yeah, it is a bit, actually. <laughs> uh, got a slight wide on now. Uh, that was great. I mean, good, yeah, he seems very ahead of his time in all <laughs> regards. Please It'll... don't be like, and he also had slaves. <laughs> that's the well that's the risk with this podcast isn't it Kat? i will it, say it really is i know i won't say that till the end actually because it spoils attention uh <laughs> one of my favorite things is is exposing the weird inconsistency in like small c conservative attitudes to things like it, he's right it's like well you'll speak to these things in front of a nurse a female nurse why why were you, were you worried about speaking in front of a female doctor and it just exposes mm. how it's just like a pathetic protectionism of mm whatever thin veil of power they appear to have you know we discussed this um yeah. recently in the uh one episode we did about mother Teresa. the catholics are so they're so obsessed with gay with gays and with homosexuality and, and uh sex outside of marriage but there's so much nonsense in the bible they don't care about like planting two types of seeds together and wearing two types of cloth uh, mm-hmm. and i kind of like that it's just like all this stuff's nonsense it's just um, people being dicks. It is. And as you well know, I, I work in a hospital by day because comedy is going really well. And uh, even now, it is mental how often people will just split it as, oh, the man's the doctor, the woman's the nurse. And that is not the case. There are plenty of female doctors and male nurses. And it's just, it's really odd and very revealing of society still that people still think that have you have you heard of that test people do where they say oh is it the surgeon stuff yeah and the man's in a car crash they take the son to the hospital and the doctor says i can't work on this person it's my son what what's happening there yeah it takes people ages doesn't it to work it out and the idea is if you don't immediately figure out <laughs> it's his mum, you're a misogynist. <laughs> well, or you have some kind of very misogyny. I fucking failed this totally, Kath. My, my, uh, my wife did it on me. 
So he did it. And I was just there for ages scratching my head. Like, but the dad's died. So who could it be? I don't understand. Uh, I thought I was a cat. I thought I was one of the good guys. I'm not. I'm a bad man. Did not In care fairness, to me. Go on. I also did the same thing. It's interesting, uh, isn't it? It's internalized misogyny. Yeah. Um, You're as woke as they get. And but mm. it, 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 you just have like, I don't know. Yeah. Internalized misogyny. You just have assumptions. Yeah. Playing mm -hmm. doctors and nurses in the playground. And those things kind of are just buried into your skull. And it doesn't matter how many Guardian op-eds you read. It's still kind of in there, isn't it? Yeah. And I think, and this is wildly off uh, now, but well, not really. Uh, you know, when people make uh, a fuss about, well, I don't see why there has to be so many gay people on television. Or, <laughs> oh, I don't see, you know, what the problem is that on the only roles that brown actors get are terrorists or whatever you know like all of that shit but it, it really does it it seeps in doesn't it if that's yeah. every uh portrayal of you so if pretty much every doctor that you see as a child on television is a man then uh it, it go it does you absorb it as a kid and um you're not going to want to become a doctor or you're not going to think you could become a doctor as a lady because well you don't see them. Charlie Fairhead, you've got a lot to answer for. Anyway, I should probably go back into comedy mode and not uh, <laughs> fucking preachy. Well, you know, Kath, I remember after we did the, the Margaret Thatcher episode, and I have a bit of a hang up about, I, I always worry that if I'm just having a left wing rant, I just think there's so much of it on the internet. I don't, mm -hmm. no one needs that from me. So I, I honestly thought, like, oh, this episode's not going to be that good. Because we just started ranting about it. Honestly, I actually think it's one of the best ones we did. I mean, there were the, 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 the factors. I think the Marin opening that we did was, very, was, was, which was just random. It was just about what would we our roles be in the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. I just think that was very funny. I thought like you'd written a good script on her, and we and we sort of did rant for a bit, but then we pulled back. And I think that is important because people need to know who we are, what we stand for, yes. all that kind of thing. So I'm sort of a bit happier about just. And the occasional rant, the old Ronald rant. Oh, are you? <laughs> anyway, or the old Norman Kerr, if you yeah, will. Indeed. <laughs> indeed. According to an 1881 edition of The Times, he supported the early closing movement, limiting the hours of labour in shops to 12 daily, writing, I have a very strong conviction on medical grounds that the present hours during which shop assistants have to work are excessive and prejudicial to health. Again, it is, it, I think he's sort of on the right side of a lot of issues. 12 hours daily, it seems mental <laughs> to us now. But, you know, I, I am happy for pro... Well, I'd rather progress was quick, but slow progress is still progress. Do you know what I mean? And I don't know what it was before this, if, if there were... Uh, it was like 16 or something insane. 12 is better. Yeah. It does always make me laugh when you've got all of these uh, people, these boomers and, and, and people in the Middle Age on Twitter being like, whoa, bloody health and safety. And you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> so you don't want, you want to be working 12 hours a day. They have to restrict it to 12 hours. Like, yeah, so you, you'd totally be happy with being in the fucking mill yeah. <laughs> for 18 hours. What, like, what do they want? Do they want to work in one of those like 1920s factories where there's a sign above the door that says four days since last fatality? You know what I mean? Yeah. Where everyone's like uh, like that zoo in Tiger King where most of the keepers are missing limbs. <laughs> That's what <Yeah>. they want. <laughs> Huge bite marks out of their thighs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. To, so his personal life. He was married to an Irish chick called Eleanor Gibson. They had a son and four daughters. She died in 1892 and he remarried in 94 to Edith Jane Henderson, who was vice president of the Women's Total Abstinence Union, presumably formed to one-up the Women's Abstinence Union and presumably later one-upped further by the Women's Total Fucking Abstinence, including from <laughs> Shandy's Union, and which was itself presumably one-upped later by the Women's We Only Drink From Natural Springs Union. Um mm -hmm. So his in, first wife died. No, I've got a fucking doctor. <laughs> you are not going on the biotech ministry because you couldn't keep your wife alive forever. <laughs> exactly. In the last year of his life, it was reported that he was suffering from Bright's disease, bronchitis and diabetes, which makes me wonder. He didn't drink. He didn't eat meat. We never really found out what he was replacing it with. 
Where's that diabetes mm. come from? Was he just like on a Mars bar only diet? And that's why he developed, <laughs> like, I don't eat meat, don't drink, but uh, I have 17 Mars bars a day. And as far as I'm aware, that's going to cause no health problems ever. <laughs> well, you've got to enjoy something, and not you? Exactly. I never get that with people. Like, I don't drink, uh, I don't smoke, I don't uh, eat anything nice. I, I have each meal as a specific portion. I drink a lot of protein and I just think where's the joy you've got to enjoy something right have a bit Kath, of cake Kathy you know do you know that I don't have any refined sugar yeah because you get scratchy eyes yeah <laughs> I get blepharitis so I, I mean it's technically not true because I usually once every six years I will cave and have a bit of cake but then I just pay the price for it for the next few days um but I replaced it with those naked bars those little dainty naked bars um, well, that's the thing. You've found something that you like the there, yeah. and you've got a medical reason to not eat sugar. Like, yeah. I wouldn't eat sugar if my eyes were on fire for three <laughs> days afterwards. I'd yeah. probably stop it. But I'm talking about people who just choose it. And I get yeah. there's being healthy and stuff. Like, of course, be healthy. But fuck me. What's the point in being alive if you're not going to have anything nice? Yeah, well, because when they're 130, they will dance on our graves, which showed that we died at the age of 57 from uh, a blood sugar complications. That's why. You know what? Either way, it doesn't make you invulnerable to cars, does it? If you get it, <laughs> us, we will die the same. That's true. So eat the cake, just not all of the cake. Yes. Uh, according to Wikipedia. Not with your eyes. <laughs> According to Wikipedia, he died of influenza in Hastings on the 30th of May, 1899, and was buried in Paddington Old Cemetery. Citation needed. Um, mm. <laughs> ka, ka, did have some wacky beliefs, as you might expect of the 19th century. Yes, yes, <laughs> this is the bit that we want. Yeah. According to the 1894 article, is smoking a disinfectant? Dr. Kerr said that. Smoke being retained in the mouth has a kind of disinfecting filter through which germs have to pass, and some of which are certainly destroyed or at least deprived of their vitality. So we clearly thought that cigarette smokes, act, cigarette smoke, acted as a kind of bouncer for your lungs, checking to mm -hmm. see if incoming air was clean, if it had the right dress code. One air shows up swaying. You're not coming in here, mate. You've had too much to drink, and you might give us emphysema. Yeah, no trainers allowed. Yeah, exactly. Take that out. But <laughs> to be fair as well, I can't imagine the air quality living in London was especially good then. So I, I can't, it really doesn't matter if you're smoking or not, does it? <laughs> That's true. I actually remember something I was going to say earlier when you were talking about uh, like drinking things at breakfast. I read and would recommend uh, William Hague, that William Hague, yes, the former foreign secretary, he did a really good biography of William Pitt the Younger. And I think it was in that. He talks about how he just, Pitt the Younger is like a very intelligent, capable man, but he just seems to be constantly drinking like, like quite hard spirits. But it talks about how the water wasn't safe at the time. And actually, sort of because alcohol was clean, I mean, it had a negative effect on you. But it was actually because it was clean. It was actually quite a, a, a preferable thing to drink from your health because you could drink yeah. water and just die of cholera or something insane. Look that. So Dr. Kerr himself, in attending cases of cholera, always made a point of smoking because of this belief he had that it was like a bouncer for your mouth and your lungs. <laughs> he wrote on the subject of cholera and having had cholera himself. Yeah, maybe that 20 pack of Benson and Hedges didn't do anything for your shits, Norman. I can only assume is smoking a disinfectant was part of a wider series of Victorian articles, including wife slapping, good for the lungs, endorsing child labour, adds 10 years to your life, and opium chomping, the ultimate vim boost. <laughs> and one last note before we make our final decision, Kath. The Society for the Study and Cure of Inebriety which he founded, still exists today under the name the Society for the Study of Addiction. That hey. was Norman Kerr. Kath, mm. would you let... Uh, I can't think of a stupid pun to do with what he did. Would you, would you, <laughs> bang, would you fuck him? <laughs> would you bang Norman <laughs> Kerr? Oh, goodness. Well, he seems like a nice man who's just trying to help. He seems like he's a lot, got quite a lot going on, so I don't think he'd be around the house much. 
Uh, he's, running, he's running 27 uh, temperance groups. Yes, <laughs> as well as being a doctor, surgeon and journalist yes. uh, in the Victorian times when everybody was sick and no <laughs> one could read. Um, well, so physically, he's not really my thing, but I do like a Scottish accent. And I, I think his personality would win me round. Uh, it, it's quite endearing that he does seem to care uh, about people. Uh, even if it is in the, the upper class uh, gentleman way of probably thinking he was superior to them. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe he did just, I don't know. He seems to understand things in a way that people didn't back then. Uh, and for that reason, I'm a fuck him. Way! That's why I picked this guy, Kath. Because I sort of saw him, I was reading about him on Wikipedia, and I thought, oh my God, this guy, by modern standards, like I said, he seems like he actually would be morally sound even now. Uh, mm. So I thought, you He'd know, get I thought... hell on Twitter. He get <laughs> hell on Twitter, wouldn't he? Oh God, yeah. But then I also think, I know, would he encourage it? I don't know. He doesn't seem. He seems polite. He doesn't seem like the person you want. He doesn't seem like someone who wants a brawl. No, but, no. Which maybe, is why you get one. But then, but maybe if you engage in any kind of political battle today, it's sort of impossible not to get drawn into that. Do you know what I mean? And maybe in that sense, yeah. he's a nice reminder of a time where you could just be someone fighting for a good cause who. I don't know, wouldn't get f- trolled by flag Twitter <laughs> for, <laughs> for suggesting that maybe women should be allowed to hold stethoscopes. Yeah, he'd be the kind of person that would share a link to like a coffee morning that they were having <laughs> to yeah. raise funds and awareness for addiction. And then somebody with a dog as their profile picture <laughs> would just be laying into him and telling him to die. Yeah, for bringing I'm his glad wo- that didn't happen. For bringing his woke coffee nonsense to to into their lives. Yeah. Uh, to be I'm, fair, he wouldn't be holding a coffee morning, would he? Actually, that's true. A water yeah. morning. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to two people: Maxwell, aka on Twitter Divi by Zero. He's like our mm-hmm. first fan, Kath. I think I've mentioned him to you before. He tweets about almost every single episode we do. Uh, and he retweets a lot of our stuff. Uh, so he's good. And the second person I want to mention is Irina. You know Irina, don't you? Isn't it your friend's I wife? I know Irina. What's the same uh, Girlfriend. Girlfriend. Irina Stowen, is that her name? Yeah. Hi, Irina. Hi, Irina. Just again, just giving you a shout out because uh, you are very good online at helping to promote our podcast. And if you want to be cool, like Irina <laughs> and Maxwell, <laughs> then share our stuff. Our preferred things are retweets or sharing the videos we the videos we clip of each episode. Just share that to your stories on Twitter so people will follow follow the link through. Uh, it's just a good way to spread the word. And if not, just literally spread the word and just say to people, mm. listen to this podcast, Historical Hot or Not. It's funny. You learn something and you hear some fun banter from two top up-and-coming UK comedians. Yes, there is a, a, a wonderful story of uh, because we, of course, have... Uh, branded condoms um historical hot or not branded condoms i uh carry a sack of them to gigs to, to give out <laughs> sometimes and i had some like a sort of sexual all... health santa claus yeah yeah exactly a horny santa <laughs> uh in june and um <laughs> i had this sack of condoms on my desk at work in order to give irena's partner one um, and one of the senior doctors walked past and went, have you got a bag of condoms? <laughs> and I went, uh, yeah. And she went, no, nah, fair enough. And just walked on. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Entirely normal. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Hey, it's a, it's, a, it's a hospital. It's a castle of health. And you're promoting health, so they cannot complain. Mm. Um, no. I don't think we need to do our shout outs for the... Uh, what do you call it? Well, you've mentioned the condoms. The the address of you saying Kofi.com is now baked into the outgoing credits. So mm-hmm. I think in this bit, we'll just promote like the social media sharing as we have done. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, which leaves it, which all that leaves is for us to say goodbye. Go off, enjoy a drink, enjoy a cup of tea, enjoy some medical marijuana, but enjoy it in safe, healthy, Dose is, is or amounts that Dr. Norm, Norman Kerr would be proud of. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, spread the word. Spread your legs. Goodbye. <laughs> See you next week, everybody. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to Historical Hot or Not, written and created by Aidan McCaffrey and Catherine Mather. The podcast art was by our good friend Richard Todd, and our theme music by excellent musician and also good friend David Eagle. We also have music by Ergo Fismas, Massa License from the Free Music Archive. If you've enjoyed us and you would like to donate to the cause, we would love you to do that also. You can find us at ko-fi.com forward slash hotnotpod and you can download bonus episodes of Historical Hot or Not from Acast Plus. The link is available on our link tree, linktree.com forward slash hotnotpod. Bye!